So much information we're concerned with nowadays takes the form of symbolic representations of entities of all sorts, arranged primarily for the purpose of manipulation by computer. Not just documents and files, but representations of people, organizations, places, things, etc. Some of these entities so represented are concrete, like specific people, specific buildings, a particular copy of a particular book. Some of these entities are virtual, like a company or the concept of the color red. Still other entities are arguably their own representations. That is, they represent some result that exists solely inside the computer and don't correspond to anything in the outside world. Information of this kind is generally referred to as data. What is data anyway? Data is the plural of datum, and I'm not being glib here, I promise. So what's a datum? A datum, that is a word that ordinary people don't often hear, can be understood as a specific fact, measurement, assertion, or claim about a thing, that is to say, about an entity. Now I'm going to conjecture here that part of the reason why you don't hear the singular word datum very often is because one datum is typically not found all by itself. This is because a datum is typically only addressable relative to the thing that it's describing. At the very least, a datum needs some kind of container, something you can point to, some kind of information resource to convey it, like a document, database, or similar structure. Because these take effort to compile, there's bound to be more than one datum per resource. And indeed, there's likely, in and around a given resource, to be a great number of data, so many that it stops making sense to talk about data as individual objects, but rather as a quantity. Just like you wouldn't say glass of waters or pail of sands, data has become a mass now. So what's the problem? Well, we regularly rely on specific information for understanding our situation, gleaning insights, planning, and making decisions. We process information at different places and times. The results of this processing are often fed into subsequent processes. The information, the data, uh, we're interested in uh, may span many different resources and systems. The information needs to be correct or is best useless if not actively harmful. Correctness is typically maintained by nominating a single authoritative source for a given piece of information, then propagating that information downstream. This means that different systems are not only going to control the representations of different entities, but different assertions about the same entities could themselves be spread across disparate information systems. These information systems themselves could be located in different administrative zones, or in other words, owned and controlled by separate people or organizations. In order to reason computationally about certain entities, it may be necessary to integrate information from two or more sources into a single working set. Transforming these representations from disparate information systems into a common working representation is a big chore that has to be done anew for each system and each category of entity. This is a huge pain even when you control all the systems in questions, and it's even a bigger pain in the much more likely scenario that you don't control all or even any of them. So we have a couple of concrete problems. Number one, how do we mitigate inaccuracies caused by outdated data. This is easy in principle. We let information systems handle the resources they can assert some meaningful authority over, and then we access these resources when we need them. But this leads us to question number two, which is how do we mitigate the transformation overhead when integrating data from a different system? Specifically, how do we encode these representations of entities so that we can maximize their reuse across information systems? including systems across administrative boundaries. Also, how do we identify and locate these entities so that we can fetch them and get them and use them? This is a question that requires a much more detailed answer. Having characterized the problem somewhat, we can go into depth with a concrete example. Take the following statement. Bob likes cookies. Now, if you were to write this down uh, as an English sentence, it may be intelligible to you, 
but as computational raw material, it's essentially worthless. About all you can do with this text, Bob likes cookies, is search it for keywords, and that won't tell you much. In order to try to reason over this piece of text, we need to turn it into a formal representation, something that looks a little bit more like this. Now, it turns out that you actually need some pretty sophisticated natural language processing to get uh, this uh, text, uh, piece of text, into a structure like this. And, of course, if I don't address the fact that I'm writing and drawing these examples on a piece of paper, I'm cheating you. Because it takes a state-of-the-art neural network, that is to say artificial intelligence, to get handwritten text into digital text to which the standard natural language processing uh, could subsequently be applied. Now, it likely would also take a custom neural net to do the same for the drawing, although you could skip the natural language processing part and go straight from the drawing to the uh, formal representation because the drawing is effectively of a formal representation. And this is, of course, with the caveat that all this cutting-edge artificial intelligence is going to probably make a mistake about 10% of the time. What I'm trying to say here is that even with modern AI to usually make sense of what is effectively mud, uh, there's a lot of value in a structured representation for data so that you don't have to go and rerun all those expensive computations that you may not always have access to. So how about some questions about what we've got up here? Well, for starters, who is Bob? Or more accurately, uh, which Bob are we talking about? because it's common knowledge that there's more than one Bob. For that matter, what is Bob? Is he a person? Is he an animal? Is he something else? Is he real or is he fictional? Is he even a he? These are details that are not immediately obvious to the computer. How about, what are cookies? You know, are we talking about the particular form of baked good? Or do we mean the pieces of data that get sent to your web browser? Or do we mean something else? And whether it is one or the other, is there a general consensus on what a cookie even is? And irrespective of that, does Bob agree with the consensus, or does he have his own private definition? For instance, if Bob is a dog, then maybe cookies are a colloquialism for dog treats. And finally, what does it mean for Bob to like something? Does it mean Bob enjoys physically eating the food item known as cookies? Or does he merely enjoy contemplating the abstract concept of cookies? This distinction might matter when you least expect it. So these are all questions that one would need answers to if you wanted to operationalize this one piddly little statement. Bob likes cookies is a single statement, a single datum, a claim about the entity Bob. It's customary that an information system will bundle together a number of such claims associated with an entity and then present that as a single logical object. It's likewise customary to bundle the bundles together into a document, database, or other identifiable information resource. That is, something you can point to, something you can go to, something you can retrieve. A familiar representation of such a bundling might be something that looks like a spreadsheet. It is customary, once again, though not essential, that each column represents a field and each row represents a record with the first row reserved to label the columns, that is, the fields. We could just as easily flip the axes, though, so that the columns represent records and the rows represent fields. This two-dimensional representation, it should be noted, is actually an illusion anyway. It's a one-dimensional sequence of one-dimensional sequences. This means that the underlying data structure could be congruent to the records, or it could be cut across all of them. This is a good overture to the kinds of challenges we're faced to when we're exchanging data between systems. The spreadsheet has no way to know which way it's oriented. Only the human user can tell. And it's not just the content, but also the structure that's meaningful. If the structure is as meaningful as the content, then we should probably pick a good one.
and it's the math people who always have the best structures. There's a number of ways to represent these structures mathematically, but a particularly appropriate one is a thing called a tuple. Think single, double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, etc. Tuple is short for n tuple, where n is some number. Each position in a tuple is identified with a meaning, so first slot means this, second slot means that, and so on. So you can make a tuple of labels and then match their positions to a bunch of tuples of values. It's a straightforward encoding scheme. And it should be noted this is very close to exactly what is often happening inside the computer. Many programming languages also make this kind of structure more convenient by providing what's called a mapping type. But all those do is collapse this lookup process from two logical steps into one. Inside a single program, running on a single computer, these structures can take any form that's most convenient for the program's execution. But if you need to move these things from one computer to another, or a different program on the same computer, or a program that exits and needs to be restarted, they have to be piled together into what amounts to a set of instructions for recreating the structure and its semantics internally. The term for said instructions is serialization, a format suitable for storing as a file or sending as a message across a communication channel like a network. So we can transform the table from this to this to this to this to this. And now we can finally talk about the actual concrete problem we're trying to solve. What we have here is one representation of an actual set of instructions to recreate one of these mapping objects. Or rather, since what you're seeing is a picture of a run of text, it is actually a representation of a representation. This formal notation, which is only one of an entire universe of formal notations, makes it much easier to move pre-digested information around. Uh, the curly braces, for instance, represent the start and end of the denotation. The colons connect the left and right sides of these key value pairs in the mapping type. The square brackets denote an explicit sequence of elements, and individual elements are separated by commas. Note as well that the spacing and line breaks are not significant. They merely are there to make this example more readable. This brings us back to the generalized Bob likes cookies problem. You can ingest this run of text into a program and it will generate the corresponding structure, but the structure will be useless to the program unless the program knows what it's looking at. The first remark is, what kind of entity does this representation even represent? Identification is often context dependent. The consuming program knows what it's being represented because it knows where the information came from. This is like saying, I found this object in the fork drawer, so it must be a fork. There are a zillion problems with this, uh, a number of which can be yoked together by contemplating what happens when we can't rely on where it came from to identify it. Uh, in order to be of any use, the object needs a mechanism for declaring what kind of thing it represents. And I won't go into specific detail yet because there are some other issues uh, that I need to address. Let's focus our attention for a moment on these left-hand side labels. These may be suitable as labels, at least in English, but are altogether unsuitable as identifiers. It's important to understand that the computer doesn't care what these identifiers are. Uh, they could be numbers, they could be wads of gibberish. The only genuine re requirement on the part of the computer is that they're unique, which in practice also entails that they are exact. Another convention, although arguably not strictly necessary, is that identifiers conform to the characters that you would see on a standard American typewriter and that they don't contain any spaces. Otherwise, identifiers are a piece of user interface where the user is typically a programmer. The way to deal with identifiers is to put them in what's called a controlled vocabulary, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a very strict dictionary of terms and their very specific meanings. Other niceties of identifiers include not, being, not only being memorable, but also inferable. That is, given knowledge of a subset of identifiers in a vocabulary, you're likely to guess the others correctly without having to go look them up. 
but really the most important thing is that they're unique. So given that, let's change those labels into something more identifier-y. And there's a few conventions for multi-word identifiers, but I'm not going to get into the detail of them, but here are a few. Again, the computer doesn't care which you use, but it's considered gauche to mix these conventions, so pick one and stick with it. So what I'm showing you here is more or less the best current practice for data exchange in network information systems. It nevertheless leaves some serious problems unsolved. So you pile together all your terminology into a controlled vocabulary, you put that online in some ad hoc form, and then you repeat the process for every information system you create. And everybody on the consuming side has to do this for your system and every other system they consume data from and their own system. So we have a situation where every information system that publishes a data interface has to define what it means by every term in its controlled vocabulary, though most of these systems are very often talking about the same things, people, companies, products, documents, etc. Considerable effort has to be done on the consumer side, either reconciling different terms that mean the same thing or reconciling the same term that's used in two or more systems that mean different things. The root of the problem is that these are just words and anybody can use them privately however they like. For instance, I can make a private rule that asserts that every time I say the word apple, what I mean is banana. But getting other people to adopt this convention requires a lot more muscle. Entities like Facebook and Google can simply command compliance with their worldview by dint of their sheer size of their platforms, which operate as totalitarian fiefdoms. You have to speak the king's tongue, that is, in order to interact with the realm. This limits not only what you can say, but also what you can mean, since interpretation is completely up to the platform in question. This is the kind of thing that standards bodies, or at least industry consortia, exist to settle. A lot of these entities are just big clearinghouses anyway for what we mean when we say X. But then come the politics. It turns out that being able to impose public definitions of what words mean is incredibly powerful. It's therefore naturally highly contested territory. And then these standards bodies are often captured by their most powerful members. And the situation reminds me of a quote I like, which goes, technology standardization is commercial diplomacy and the purpose of the individual players, as with all diplomats, is to expand one's area of economic influence while defending the sovereign territory. Standards bodies decouple these controlled vocabularies from the platforms, but as I just said, influencing the content of these vocabularies, either in the terms themselves or what they mean, is a costly process. So what if there was a way to create these controlled vocabularies unilaterally and then put them online for whoever wants to use them? What if, likewise, you could use and extend third-party vocabularies just as you would any open source software? It turns out that standardizing this capability has been in the works since 1996, and while it was slow to get going, it's had all the necessary parts, in my opinion, in place since about 2010 at the latest in order to fully use and get benefit from. This family of standards is called RDF, or more informally, linked data. You might also hear the phrase knowledge graph, which is a new sort of idea on the scene. Uh, and you might remember hearing the phrase semantic web. These are all overlapping regions in a Venn diagram. What does it consist of? Well, you take these identifiers and you turn them into web addresses. What is the effect of this change? Well, first of all, it guarantees that the identifiers will be unique in a global context since URLs have an authority component. And in the case of web addresses, that authority component is a domain name. Number two is if the vocabulary authors themselves follow best practices, the terms are de facto links to their own documentation and formal machine readable spec. And this turns out to be extremely handy. And finally, number three, these formal specifications are therefore online and available for anybody to use and build off of. And then the ones that are useful get currency within the community and then they stick around. 
What about side effects? Sure. The identifiers themselves are naturally going to get longer. You can't really avoid that. This means there's more to type and therefore more to mistype if you're laying these structures out by hand. By the way, don't lay these structures out by hand. There's a lot of automated help you can use for it. You're also going to see arguments uh, that all of these extra letters are inefficient for storage and transmission of the data. In practice, any efficiency penalty is going to be negligible for a bunch of reasons, compression and other stuff. Um, there's likewise uh, common conventions that make the basis for this complaint to go away. There is also, in my opinion, the more serious problem of these vocabularies disappearing from the web or their authors otherwise losing control over them, but this can be mitigated through sensible practices as well. And I can also remark that we can give the same URL treatment to the identity of the resource itself along with the type of entity it's supposed to represent. So why aren't these standards being used more broadly? The answer is that these standards are being used, just not in the one place you'd expect them to be, that is mainstream web development. In fact, the big operators are publishing and journalism, other than the web ostensibly, Glamour, that is galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and records. Finance, hedge funds, etc. Uh, government, but the big one, uh, sensibly, is biomedical. And you see that industry's fingerprints all over the place in this space. These standards also are being used on the web in a narrow sense. Google and Facebook use RDF to help you help them put enhanced web page previews on Google and Facebook, respectively but they've managed to mangle it each in their own way so that the information isn't terribly useful for anything but putting web page previews on Google and Facebook. And I should also remark that Twitter made a superficially similar effort, but it doesn't look like they even tried to comply with the standards. And I'm not exactly sure why this is the case, that these standards don't get wider adoption though. A common argument against them is usually an aesthetic one couched in efficiency at some scale or other. Often the charge is that the technology unnecessarily complicates things. And it does complicate things initially, as introducing any new way of doing things would. There's no denying that. But what it does and what it does not qualify as necessary depends on what your values are. So let's talk about that. The technologies that underpin linked data are very good at decoupling meaningful information content from the particular silo in which it is stored. The principal business model of Silicon Valley and its would-be mimics elsewhere in the world is precisely to build silos in order to hoard and arbitrage data. I mean, that's literally what a platform is. Indeed, at the heart of any business, is to give people a reason to deal with you instead of somebody else. Information is an attractive reason because while it can be copied, it can't be substituted. So for any particular piece of information, if people can't get a copy easier somewhere else, they'll have to get it from you. But what if you don't care about hoarding data? The key benefit of this technology is moving information between distinct systems. People who work at companies who don't prioritize this kind of interoperability are going to view it as unnecessarily complicated. We can also postulate that this is because gaining proficiency around radical interoperability simply doesn't get you promoted in what has come to be called surveillance capitalism. But virtually every organization has more than one information system, so this capability is still useful even if you don't expose it to end users. That's because it solves a host of practical problems that arise when trying to merge information from disparate systems. You can tell they're serious problems because there are alternative and, in my opinion, inferior attempts to solve them. But what if you don't care about hoarding data? What if you're a company whose value proposition was precisely that your customers could cash out 100% of their data and never look back? Then you could take advantage of solutions to a raft of boring practical problems that have plagued information systems for as long as they've existed and open up an entire new arena of competition 
where the data hoarding incumbents will have a hard time chasing you. Or what about organizations that exist to share information and or don't compete in the traditional sense, like universities, government agencies, think tanks, museums and archives, societies, unions, and trade or professional associations, etc. Organizations like these don't have the same priorities as tech startups, so why derive their methods from Silicon Valley values? From my own perspective, and in my professional capacity, there are two principles I adhere to. One, that a business relationship is likely to be more equitable if there are alternatives to it. And two, that computers could be doing way more work than they currently do. Relationships with businesses built upon hoarding data are naturally lopsided in their favor. That's just their nature. And if we rely exclusively on these entities, our capabilities to understand our environment and to express ourselves as individuals, communities, and citizens in civil society will always be limited to whatever is on their menu. Just like the free and open source software movements of previous decades, this radical decoupling of data from data silos is a political agenda. It's my conviction that people and organizations who have the temerity to view truly open data as a strength rather than a weakness will be rewarded if not immediately, then surely in the longer term. Perhaps this could be you.